70% of the world's surface is ocean, hence the name the Blue Planet. But did you know that over 80% of it remains completely unexplored? Who knows what's lurking at the bottom of the depths? In fact, it's often claimed that we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the ocean floor on our own planet. Isn't that just absolutely crazy? I'm Ryan from Tragedy Tales, and this week, we're diving right back into five horrors on the waves. From the tragic sinking of the MV Sewol to a freak shark attack in Mexico. This week, we've got the lot. So, as usual, you know what I'm going to say. Sit down and pull the curtains. Let's get right into it. On a bright summer's day, on July the 7th, 2010, families and tourists boarded the Ride the Ducks vessel in Philadelphia, anticipating a pleasant tour along the Delaware River. The mood was light, with children's laughter mixing with the excited chatter of tourists. Little did they know this idyllic scene was about to take a truly harrowing turn. I've actually covered the Ride the Ducks company and duck boat before on this channel. In 2018, one of the dock boats sank on Table Rock Lake in Missouri, leading to the tragic deaths of 17 people. I'll link that above if you're interested in that. But dock boats are basically an amphibious vehicle that can be driven on land and can also venture into the water. While their origins stem from a World War II vehicle, they have since been converted by the Ride the Docks company and other companies to commercial vehicles, being modified to take as many people as possible to make as much profit as possible. These particular kind of modifications cause problems with balance and duck boats are just not great seafaring vessels in general. However, that July day, at around 2.25 p.m., the tour was progressing through the Delaware River on their Ride the Ducks duck boat when the unexpected happened. The captain of Duck Boat 34 noticed a funny smell and then starts to see white smoke entering the passenger cabin. Believing there was a fire on board, the master of Duck Boat 34 shut down the engine and executed the emergency fire procedures. As the boat began to drift, the deckhand deployed the anchor and awaited rescue. The passengers, initially unfazed, waited patiently for rescue. But tension mounted as a large barge pushed by a tugboat ominously approached in the distance, growing perilously closer by the minute. Petrolat, one of the passengers on the dock boat, noticed that the captain was mounting concern. He'd radioed into the tugboat, telling him to move around them and to not hit them, saying that their engine was not working and they couldn't move, but no response was given. To the northbound tug in front of Ben's landing, this is duck 34. I am at anchor. I am unable to I am broken down. Over. Northbound barge, your partner's landing, please come back. The northbound dog. Hey, Sperry, 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 woo, 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 woo! Hey, northbound barge, northbound barge, your pants rain, that duck boat's broken down. Alarmingly, even with the imminent threat, no instructions were given to don life jackets by the duck boat captain. The barge, massive and unyielding, continued its steady advance. Now, for this to make sense, I kind of need to explain the background of large boats in general. When massive ships arrive at a port city such as New York or anything like that, they find themselves in a tight space with lots of obstacles to navigate. To aid the ship, huge boats are pushed by the thrust of a smaller boat behind. Despite them pushing the boats, these vessels are called tugboats. I know, weird, right? These smaller vessels are supposed to guide the massive ships to avoid calamity. Well, they're supposed to at least. The Delaware River is almost 2,200 feet wide where this was all occurring. So therefore, it theoretically offered ample room for the barge to navigate around the stalled duck boat. However, the tugboat pilot that was guiding the massive sludge barge up the Delaware River that day 
was being operated by a very negligent man, Matthew Devlin. Matthew was leading the colossal barge, blind and deaf. At some point in the afternoon, he left his post watching ahead and instead went to go take a personal call with his wife. With his attention diverted and the radio turned completely down, he was oblivious to the emergency unfolding around him. Petulat, one of the survivors, describes it saying, We were hit. It was an awful sound. Metal on metal. We rolled. We were in the water. The river, usually so clean, turned into a dark abyss. Panic followed as passengers plunged underwater, desperately trying to reach the surface. People inside could do nothing but pray they survived. All captured on video, the barge collided with the duck boat, swallowing it under the waves like it was nothing. You can also see in the video one of the crew members abandoning ship just before the barge struck. The barge never stopped, leading to the sinking of the duck boat, carrying 35 passengers and two crew members. This resulted in the heartbreaking loss of two Hungarian students. A passenger by the name of Dora was one of the victims. She had heroically thrown her life jacket to the duck boat's first mate in a desperate attempt to save him. This heroic act can also be seen in the footage. Tragically, this left her without her life jacket and she lost her life in the process. Testimonies from other survivors painted a vivid picture of the chaos and fear that engulfed the boat as it sank. People were rescued from the water and then the attention turned as to who was responsible. Investigations by the National Transport Safety Board revealed that this all occurred because of Matthew Devlin, the pilot of the tugboat. They said that Matthew's inattention was the primary cause for this disaster. He was completely engrossed in personal calls and failed to notice the vulnerable duck boat in its path. The time of the crash was 2.37 p.m. This was more than an hour after Matthew left the upper pilot house. Personally, I find it absolutely terrifying that someone so careless could be the pilot for such a large vessel. Families were fuming at the fact that this could have all been avoided and of course, lawsuits followed. The pilot of the tugboat, Matthew Devlin, then 35, was brought to court for his actions. He admitted negligence, eventually pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter, admitting to the fact that he was not paying attention when the barge he was pushing rammed into the disabled duck boat. In court, Matthew expressed his sincere remorse revealing that he had been dealing with a personal emergency regarding an operation on his son's eyes during the voyage. He apologized to the families and told them that their loved ones were in his mind 24 seven. The court sentenced him to one year and one day in federal prison, followed by three years of supervised release. He also was forced to surrender his merchant mariner license, meaning he could never captain a ship again. The aftermath of the accident saw legal battles between the families of the victims and the companies operating the vessels. Wrongful death lawsuits were filed against KC Transportation, which were operating the tugboat. Lawsuits were also filed against the Ride the Docks company, the tourboat operator. The dispute culminated in a $17 million settlement with the families of the deceased students receiving the majority of the compensation. Despite this not really being the dock boat's fault, other than the life jacket situation and the poor handling before the collision, after this incident, the ride the ducks on the Delaware River were permanently suspended. However, the dock boat tours by the ride the ducks company using these dangerously converted vehicles continued all across America, leading to a fatal crash in 2015, killing five, and the tragic Table Rock incident, as mentioned previously, leading to the deaths of 17 people. This latter incident was enough for the Ride the Ducks company to close, ceasing operations permanently in 2019.
Blue Lagoon Island, also known as Salt Cay, is a serene private island located just off Nassau in the Bahamas. This idyllic spot is famed for its peaceful beauty and the unique experiences it offers with dolphins and sea lions. Each year, Blue Lagoon Island draws in thousands of tourists. Many of these travel on cruise ships, often making stops on other beloved destinations like Paradise Island. So picture this, you're on a boat in the Bahamas with your family, weaving through the islands, soaking up the glorious weather and the crystal clear waters it's the very last place that you'd expect a terrifying ordeal to take place. This alarming event unfolded on November the 14th, 2023. That day, a double-decker catamaran cruise ship containing 30 or so passengers was making its way from Paradise Island to Blue Lagoon, a straightforward and simple journey. Now, the weather was sunny, but as the ship progressed, the water turned unexpectedly choppy and rough. The ride wasn't as smooth as it was when they left. The journey began at 9.30 a.m. with everyone looking forward to exploring Blue Lagoon. But as the ship approached its destination at 11 a.m., things took a dire turn. Now this was reported, but it's not proven, but the captain, in an attempt to showcase a dramatic maneuver to the passengers and other boats, sharply turned the boat as it neared the shore to sort of aim the rear end towards the, the island, you know, to show off. However, his stunt went seriously wrong. As he swung the boat around, it began to list, letting water flood into the main cabin, causing panic among those below deck. American tourist Kelly Chisel documented the whole ordeal in a TikTok video. So we were on a two-tiered ferry, but um, we started to like slap stop and like turn to go into the like blue lagoon area and we kind of i kind of thought like the captain was trying to be silly and like whip a shitty because we all kind of went forward and the water kind of splashed up kind of looking over the um the edge and you could see that there was water coming into the boat and we were starting to like the we were staying lean forward just because we were starting to sink the captain driving it was like laughing because I think he was kind of showing off. Like I said, I thought he was trying to whip the butt end around and I just don't think it worked out the way he wanted it to. Then once we realized we were starting to sink and we saw the water coming in, people were screaming, people, people are freaking out. We all got our life jackets on. She said everyone quickly donned life jackets and moved to the higher side of the top deck. The situation escalated when a crew member visibly distraught and crying rushed upstairs to grab a life jacket apparently the crew were in hysterics and unable to provide clear instructions to the passengers so we we again we were waiting for the staff to direct us on what to do and they didn't so once we got to the point that one guy jumped in and everybody else was like shit we might as well do the same thing everyone on the boat realized the gravity of the predicament they donned life jackets and moved to the boat's upper level but the fear was palpable. All captured in the viral footage from the incident, the footage shows people in life jackets crowded on one side of the tilting ship. It's absolutely horrifying. Terror struck as they realized the ship was sinking. Passengers began to jump into the increasingly rough waters and many struggled to keep their heads above the waves. As the ship capsized, mayday calls were made Unfortunately, they were close to Blue Lagoon. Emergency teams, including the Royal Bahamas Defense Force and local authorities responded swiftly. They got to the scene and began evacuating passengers and saving lives in the process. Once they arrived at Blue Lagoon, two passengers were rushed to hospital for their injuries, but the crew still didn't perform a head count. This was only done by one of the passengers, Kelly. Thankfully, they were all accounted for. However, in a tragic turn, a 75-year-old American woman who had been hospitalized passed away the following day. Her cause of death is unknown. But this story is a sobering reminder that even a legendary cruise ship can turn perilous. If the reports are accurate, the captain's reckless attempt to impress with a dramatic entrance put everyone's lives in jeopardy. Remarkably, no lawsuits have been filed and it seems the captain continues to operate these cruises to this very day.
This harrowing tale unfolded on December the 2nd, 2023, in the scenic setting of the Malarkey Beach in Jalisco, Mexico. Despite the slightly overcast skies that day, the allure of the sun was enough to draw people to the shores. Among them was 26-year-old Maria Fernanda Martinez, a marine biology student at the University of Guadalajara. Maria was a part-time hotel employee, and that day she chose to spend her day off going to the beach with her five-year-old daughter. Sounds fun, right? Even the lack of sunlight wouldn't deter Maria and her daughter from venturing out into the waters. That fateful Saturday morning, at around 11 a.m., as the beach began to buzz to life, a truly chilling episode was set to unfold. As Maria was swimming 65 feet from the shore, she suddenly felt a sharp strike on her leg. She looked down to see that a massive shark had targeted her. Being in the water with her five-year-old daughter, this put her in a frantic state, acutely aware of her daughter's safety. Maria's instincts propelled her into action. Desperately, she swam to a nearby floating play platform. As she reached it, in a valiant effort to save her daughter, Maria pushed her to safety onto the platform, but not before the shark delivered one more grievous bite. Horrified witnesses recalled hearing screams and seeing the water turn a distressing shade of red. Brave beachgoers plunged into the perilous waters to rescue her and dragged her from the sea. The gravity of Maria's injuries were heartbreakingly evident. Her entire left leg was missing. It had been completely severed by the shark and lost to the ocean. The aftermath, all captured in viral videos, they showed Maria being pulled ashore, her condition rapidly deteriorating amidst the shock and the blood loss. Because Maria was missing her entire leg, her femoral artery had been severed, causing her to hemorrhage blood into the sand. Despite the crowd's best efforts and the swift arrival of emergency services, by then, it was too late. By the time the emergency services arrived, Maria had succumbed to blood loss on the beach. In a miraculous twist, Maria's heroic act had managed to save her daughter, who remained safely on the play platform spared from a similar tragic fate. The news of a fatal shark attack spread rapidly, prompting local authorities to issue warnings and take immediate safety measures. Officials announced that there had not been a shark attack in this area for 60 years and emphasized their commitment to public safety. They said that they were gonna build a couple of surveillance towers and that they were gonna close beaches until further notice. These kind of stories are the exact reason that I now fear the ocean. I tell everyone to be careful of shark attacks now. This could very well be your best mate, your brother, or even yourself. While sharks don't really want to eat humans, they will if they think you're an easy meal. The first bite is them testing the waters, and the second is usually them filling their stomachs. In a heartfelt tribute, locals erected a makeshift altar on the beach marking the spot of Maria's tragic demise. A solemn reminder of life's fragility and the sacrifice that Maria made to save her daughter. This entry begins on the morning of October the 25th, 2015 in the picturesque town of Tofino. Now, Tofino is a small town located on Vancouver Island in the Canadian province of British Columbia. The town has just 2,500 residents. However, the general area swells each year with a million tourists. Now, this is because Tofino is a gem for outdoor activities such as surfing and hiking, and it's also a global hotspot for whales drawing whale watchers and tourists from far and wide. However, on that fateful day, 24 people and three crew boarded the whale watching boat, the Leviathan II. Stretching 65 feet, the Leviathan II set off from the Tofino Harbor at 1.30 p.m. 
They were going for a routine whale watching cruise and the tour began as you'd expect. Nothing out of the ordinary with a safety briefing akin to those given before flights. 50 minutes into the journey, as the vessel ventured towards the open ocean, one of the passengers called Christian Bartfield, seated near the captain, Wayne Dolby, a seasoned captain of 18 years, sensed the sea conditions were changing. The boat got rougher and rougher, and despite the captain's calm demeanor, Bartfield felt uneasy and moved to the ship's lower level. Another passenger from Germany also sensed the shifting mood. He paused on the middle deck, watching sea lines play near Plover Rocks, momentarily distracted from his anxiety. Now this is when, all of a sudden, a colossal wave swept in. The crew could do nothing to steer away, and before they knew it, it hit the ship. Some passengers say they saw the wave. They described it as a giant, higher than the boat. It came towards them, and they braced for impact. As it crashed over the stern, it instantly flipped the 33-ton boat, plunging it and its occupants into the cold, frigid waters. Life jackets were not enforced on this journey, so none of the passengers were actually wearing them. Passengers who were on the bottom floor of the sinking boat described the ordeal like being thrown around like laundry in a washing machine. Now, as you're all probably aware, a sudden plunge into cold water can be deadly, as the low temperatures will induce automatic gasping, causing one to possibly take in water and pass out. The cold water also causes hyperventilation and immense strain on the heart. In such conditions, even the strongest swimmers can be quickly incapacitated. Amongst the chaos and the screams, moments of heroism and despair unfolded. Passengers and crew were thrown into the turbulent water fighting for their lives. It all happened so fast that crew members on the Leviathan 2 didn't have any time to send a distress call and it was only by chance that they were able to activate a flare after the boat tipped, alerting nearby boaters. In this footage, captured from another boat near the vicinity, the Leviathan 2 can be seen sticking 20 feet out the water. It looked like it was standing on its end. As the boat sank, some survivors clung to a single life ring that floated in the water, while others clung to the sinking vessel. Other passengers had already drifted out in the water towards the rocky shore. With the Coast Guard coordinating everything, an estimated 24 to 36 boats, mostly charter boats and some commercial fishing boats, lent a hand to rescue who they could and search for those who were missing. Miraculously, 21 people were pulled alive from the water. What they'd been through just doesn't bear thinking about. The search for other survivors would go on for days. And tragically, by the end of this ordeal, six people had lost their lives, including five British nationals and an Australian. In the aftermath, the MV Leviathan II was towed to shore for inspection. And soon after, multiple passengers who were on the boat began class action lawsuits against the whale watching company. Their claims alleged that the ship's captain, Wayne Dolby, should have known of the large swells in the area and he should have known that they were hazardous. They claimed that the vessel's stability would have been affected by having most passengers on one side of the deck and this is why the wave toppled the boat so quickly. We're out in the water today on the area where the seals are, where, where the sinking sea happened. lions, yeah. Yeah, with, sorry, where the sea lions were today. I mean, certainly there are a lot of reefs in the area and the swells can get, while well, we were out on the water, I mean, pretty, quite, quite severe. I mean, is the sense right now, as you understand it, based on initial reports, that the boat hit a, a wave that was caused by one of those reefs and flipped? Or what, what's sort of the initial, so we can just help people understand what happened? This, what's your initial report? This is an area that the boat goes to every day. Uh, yesterday was no different than any other day. 
uh, as I said, that this does have its own sea conditions in there. Uh, the vessel uh, is operated by professionals. We, we, we operate under guidelines for, for safety as far as uh, uh, what happens with the vessel itself in, in close encounters with uh, rocks and also with the wildlife. So uh, the wildlife viewing guides mandate 100 yards from essentially the rocks because that's where the sea lions are. After an investigation, it was later found that the captain had a secret, debilitating eye illness that made it difficult for him to acquire a normal visual image in all parts of his visual field. Wayne had kept this a secret because he was scared that if he told anyone, they wouldn't let him do his job anymore. While I can't see that there was ever a public payout to the families, in 2018, the investigating coroner, Courtney Cole, ruled that all the deaths were accidental. She ruled that Mr. Dolby's eyesight problems were not the cause of the tragedy and that the freak wave was to blame. Courtney stated that cold incapacitation is lethal and even with life jackets, the struggle to stay afloat is immense. She recommended that the federal department require life jackets to be worn on the outer decks of a vessel larger than 15 gross tons and carrying more than 12 passengers. She also said that more vessels should be required to carry emergency position indicating radio beacons. The whale watching company, Jamie's Whaling Station, quickly implemented these changes and continued to take hundreds of people on whale watching tours across Tofino to this very day. On a seemingly tranquil evening of April the 15th, 2014, the MV Sewol, bound for picturesque Jeju Island, departed from Incheon, a South Korean city bordering the capital of Seoul. However, before we can set sail, we need to know a bit of background of the ferry itself. From 1994 to 2012, the MV Sewol was known as the ferry Namanu, it operated in Japan with an impeccable safety record for over 18 years. However, in 2012, a marine company purchased the ferry for approximately 11.3 million US dollars. Subsequently, the ferry was rechristened as Suwol and underwent renovations. These renovations and upgrades involved the installation of additional passenger cabins on the third, fourth and fifth decks. These increased the ship's capacity by 117 and added 239 tons of weight. These modifications would soon play a vital part in the tragedy that was about to unfold. So, on the evening of April the 15th, despite the weather being calm, as the time came to depart at around 7.30pm, a deep fog began drifting in from across the water. The fog was that dense that the ferry departed from the dock at 9.30 p.m., two hours later than expected. That night, the NV Sewol was carrying within it the laughter and dreams of 325 students from Danwon High School, located in Ansan City. The students were all aged around 16 years old and they were poised for a memorable school trip. In total, 476 people embarked on this voyage Unbeknownst to the passengers, the ship was a disaster waiting to happen. As I said before, the vessel had undertaken modifications that increased its passenger capacity. These modifications were, in fact, illegal. The upgrades to the ship compromised its structural integrity and balance. And to make it worse, on this fateful journey, the ship was also loaded with poorly strapped cargo three times its safe limit. This reckless oversight set the stage for one of South Korea's most heart-wrenching maritime disasters of all time. Throughout the night, as Suwol made its way along its usual route, it navigated the treacherous Manningol Channel with precision, a stretch of water known for its harsh currents. At some point in the night, the captain went to sleep and left an inexperienced third mate in charge of the wheel. Throughout the night, there were no problems. At 8.48 a.m., 
the ship had reached approximately one and a half kilometers off the island of Dongichado, South Yola, South Korea. With the third mate still captain in the boat, he made a series of sharp turns that triggered an irreversible domino effect. The third mate wrenched on the wheel, and as he made that final turn, the ferry, destabilized by its excessive and unsecured load, began to list harshly 20 degrees to port side. Because a very sharp turn would have shifted the thousand tons of cargo and nearly 200 cars that were inside. And that would explain why the ferry started listing or leaning to one side. It was soon tilting at more than five degrees, a critical threshold because that's a point of no return. Inside, a surreal and terrifying scene unfolded. Hallways and rooms tilted at alarming angles. Objects became dangerous projectiles. A total nightmare ensued. Amidst the chaos, an automated message played through the tannoy, commanding the students to don life jackets and to remain in their rooms. Most of the students trusted their superiors, trusted that they knew best, and remained in their rooms, even as the water began trickling inside. While they bunkered down, the students, gripped by fear and disbelief, resorted to their mobile phones. Many families back in South Korea received extremely worrying phone calls from their children, detailing that they were on the ferry, saying that it had begun to sink. As rescue made their way to them, students captured videos of the horrors that were unfolding inside. These digital footprints, later shared widely, painted a haunting picture of the tragedy. They showed students lying on the floor, trying to lighten the mood, donning life jackets, and sending poignant farewells to their loved ones. Code blue red, code blue red. You go boys, you know, 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 you some were joking around, saying that this is like the Titanic, some saying that they don't want to die here, but for others, the seriousness of the situation had begun to set in. They were crying and praying that they survived this. The repeated intercom announcements continued to instruct passengers to stay where they were, over and over and over. Sewol's first emergency phone call was received at 8.55 a.m. However, it came not from the crew, but from a student who had used their cell phone to contact emergency services from aboard the sinking ship. He cried out, help us, the boat is sinking. This marked the start of a complex and ultimately heart-wrenching rescue operation. The South Korean Coast Guard, along with other rescue vessels, were dispatched promptly. By 9.18 a.m., the boat was now reported to be quickly sinking. The crew now reported that it was listing at an angle of more than 50 degrees. As more emergency calls went out, fishing boats and other commercial vessels rushed to the scene, quickly rescuing around 86 people from the water. At 9.23 a.m., a second call for help was received from the crew of Sewol. The ship continued to list and filled with water. This distress call just said, we are about to sink. At 9.38 a.m., around an hour after the ship had begun to list, the South Korean Coast Guard arrived at the sinking ferry. Multiple helicopters and many boats arrived at the scene. Upon arrival, the rescuers were met with the daunting sight of the Seoul listing 50 to 60 degrees to port. They'd missed their chance at rescuing these people easily. Now, rescue had arrived, but rescue workers wasted precious time with indecisiveness they failed to contact the ferry's crew and instruct them to give an evacuation order, let alone getting inside and pulling people out. This would now be a very difficult operation. Despite a massive Navy vessel being very close by and other various ships, 
The South Korean Coast Guard told them, no, we want to save our students, this is our job, and rejected multiple offers of help. Some passengers who had managed to reach the deck jumped into the sea and were saved, but many were not so lucky. Many remained in their rooms, watching the rescue unfold through their windows. Now, it's tradition that when a boat sinks, that the captain stays to the very end, only leaving the vessel once everyone had escaped. Infuriatingly, however, in this case, the ferry's crew and the captain were among the first to be evacuated. This breach of duty led to widespread outrage and severe legal repercussions. Now you're wondering, why did it take them so long to get to the ship? Well, long story short, the original distress call reported on the original departure time. Now, because they left two hours later, rescue arrived to the scene where they thought they'd be, and they weren't there. By the time rescue even arrived, escape was impossible. While some were saved by smashing the windows from the outside, Many of the windows could not be broken and rescuers had to watch them sink. Heartbreaking footage emerged showing the passengers trapped aboard the ferry, desperately trying to break the windows, watching desperately as people were saved outside. They tried and tried, but rescue just watched them struggle as they focused their attention on people that were easier to save. Soon, these parts of the ship disappeared beneath the waves. As the day progressed, the scale of the rescue operation expanded dramatically. The situation inside Sewol grew increasingly dire. Water began flooding in, filling the rooms full of students. They began to become frantic as rooms turned almost vertical. Still, the automated message played through the tannoy, telling them to stay where they were. This tannoy message would later be heavily criticized. Many who followed these instructions found themselves trapped in their room as the ferry filled with water when they could have saved themselves if they at least tried. As the hole began to disappear, rescuers were now faced with the daunting task of entering the tilting ferry. This is something that they just didn't want to do. And at 11.18 a.m., two and a half hours after it began to list, the MV Sewol completely capsized. Only one out of the 46 lifeboats that were on the ship were deployed. Now, all that could be seen from the surface was the underside of the boat, Rescue teams had missed their chance. By 2.42 p.m., an extensive rescue force, including 150 members of the Republic Korean Army Special Warfare Command and 40 scuba divers were deployed. The numbers just got more and more. However, as the day went on, weather conditions began to get worse and officials deemed it far too risky to enter the sinking vessel and therefore the rescue teams just gave up. At 8 p.m., they ceased their rescue attempts and left hundreds dead inside. This was all just a total nightmare. Why weren't they told to get off the ship? Why was no one told anything? It just seems crazy. The search operations resumed again at around midnight using flares, but the number of casualties just climbed. By the morning of April the 17th, the diver count had now escalated to 555. But back on land, the families of the passengers cried out for help, cried out for more to be done to save their loved ones. The anger and the frustration was palpable. You must have said, Daddy, save me, weeps this father. No one is immune to the sound of losing a child. Around 2 p.m. on April the 17th, Weather conditions worsened again and caused a near halt in rescue operations. A marine crane was brought into the scene later that night, but still hundreds were missing. Now this is when it gets really slimy. Misinformation compounded the tragedy on April the 17th. The South Korean government created massive public confusion by releasing the wrong statistics on death tolls and the amount of people that were missing. They reported that there was 368 survivors this led to various South Korean media outlets also releasing this news. 
However, as the day of April the 17th dragged on, this figure was later revised by the government, stating that in fact, 295 passengers were missing. So basically, they were lying and saying that people had been rescued when they had not, giving false hope to families and friends. Throughout the following days, on April the 18th to April the 21st, the Korean Coast Guard initiated a process to pump air into the capsized ship, hoping to support any existing life. Rescue efforts were hampered by the fact when divers entered into the ship, it was all restricted by the cargo. However, as the months went on, the death toll only continued to rise. This whole ordeal had turned into a full-blown nightmare, largely due to the lack of urgency by the South Korean Coast Guard and their insistence on handling the situation without any external help. Despite the South Korean government's attempt to hide and downplay its culpability, the sinking of the MV Sewol resulted in the loss of 304 people predominantly students. An incomprehensible loss, and most tragically, a totally avoidable one. Shortly after the incident, many accused the Coast Guard of not acting quick enough or aggressively enough to save people from the sinking ferry. This disaster triggered a national outcry for reform and accountability. Parents of the deceased students were particularly vocal, expressing their fury and grief over the loss of their children, stating more lives could have been saved if the Coast Guard had acted with any amount of urgency the nation was plunged into a period of intense national mourning. Investigations revealed a disturbing picture of negligence and incompetence. An inquiry by the Board of Order Inspection, or the BAI, exposed that the ferry's captain declared the cargo weight at 657 tonnes, but according to the investigation, it actually surpassed 2,140 tonnes. And to make this even worse, none of it was strapped down properly. The BAI also reported that port authorities in Incheon, where the Suol set sail, allowed the departure, relying on the cargo information provided by the captain, without even conducting their own inspection of the cargo. The BAI discovered that staff from the company that owned the ship had offered the Incheon Coast Guard officials drinks and complimentary trips on the boat, which aided in the Suol's passing its safety inspections. So the Suol was doomed by corruption from the very start. This tragedy really did expose the shortcomings in South Korea's approach to public safety and crisis management. South Korea's National Assembly later voted to disband their Coast Guard, partially placing the blame of the tragedy on them. A new safety agency was then set up and the police took over the Coast Guard's responsibilities. So the Coast Guard was that bad that they were disbanded. Of course, legal proceedings followed with the captain initially receiving a life sentence for abandoning the ship. This sentence was later reduced to 36 years. Other crew members were also indicted, and politically, the disaster stirred public outrage and contributed to the impeachment of the president as her government faced criticism for their terrible response to the disaster. Memorials were established, serving as a solemn reminder of the lives lost and the lessons learned. In 2017, a significant salvage operation was initiated not only to recover the nine bodies that were still missing, but to also further investigate the causes of the sinking. This tragedy remains South Korea's deadliest ferry disaster since December the 14th, 1970, when the Namyang ferry sank, claiming 326 lives. However, what makes the Sewol slightly worse is the fact that 304 people died and around 250 of these were students from the same school. The sinking of the MV Sewol is a tragedy that South Korea and the world will never forget 
leaving a permanent mark on the nation. But that is the end of the video. Holy moly, this one was unbelievably tragic. The Suo is a total nightmare, as you guys have just seen, and one that could have been totally avoided if rescue teams had actually tried, got to the right area when mayday calls were made, and if the crew even tried to tell the passengers what to do at all. Nothing was done, these people were left for dead, and my heart goes out to them. I'm glad that the people responsible were punished. 36 years in prison is not a short sentence at all, but nothing will bring back those who were lost. The whale watching horror just goes to show how a fun encounter can quickly go terribly wrong. And I was amazed that so many people were rescued from the water, being that it was icy cold and in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, well done to them. Maria, who perished on the beach in Mexico, is a reminder that sharks can strike at any time. When you're swimming in the ocean, you're swimming in their domain. However, this story is a true testament of love for her daughter. While her efforts saved her life, Maria lost hers in doing so. The Bahamas cruise ship terror. The footage actually shocked me how terrifying these ordeals can be. I was surprised that only one person lost their lives, but that doesn't make it any less tragic. And the tragic duck boat incident, again, is a completely avoidable tragedy one that should have never happened. If Matthew was looking at where he was going, doing his job that he's been paid to do, this would have all never occurred. In my opinion, Matthew deserved a lot longer in prison than just one year for the deaths of two innocent students. But most importantly, what do you think? What do you think of this video? I say this in all my videos, but I do try and read every single comment. But I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.